All right, next up, I want to get on to our third speaker. And for this, I'd like to bring on Elena to tell you about Ironfish 2.0. So please give Elena a big round of applause. Hello, hello. Does this work? OK, cool. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for being here. I know these conferences are uh, you know, sometimes not as, uh, not as fun, but last conversation was pretty great. <laughs> um, cool, so I'm here to talk to you about privacy. Um, and so first, you know, why are we making a big deal about privacy anyways? And uh, transparent chains, which is basically all chains, uh, they, expo they, they expose all transaction details. So for instance, I saw this on Twitter once where, you know, oh my gosh, how great you can get notified when your friends uh, get a big win. And it's like, well, actually, maybe you don't want your friends to know that. Um, and uh, because of how we use uh, cryptocurrency today, we're basically linking our real identities to our accounts. So for instance, like that's Chris Dixon's you know, kind of wallet, and you can kind of see all the NFTs he has. Um, and then for transparent chains, we also have like built-in surveillance of all of our transactions, and that's how we know all of Trump's holdings. Um, and I think our, there are people from Arkham here <laughs> that, that are actually re uh, representing that project. Um, and so there are other reasons why transparent chains are kind of a, a bad idea in terms of using crypto for real world, world payments. And so then the question becomes of like, how do we make, how do we bring privacy to crypto? And crypto is not new to privacy projects. Um, apparently there are 700, more than 700 privacy projects that have been tried or potentially are still trying. Um, but out of those all 700, I still don't know what I would use if I wanted to send $20 privately to, to someone, to anyone. Um, and so when I think about the 700 plus of privacy projects that we have today, I feel like, you know, that, <laughs> that uh, uh, the, the woman m math meme lady of like, okay, but what do I use? Like, if I just want to send private USDC, like, uh, there's 700 projects and they all say that there are privacy projects, but what do I use? Like, what protocol do I use? What chain? What asset? Um, a lot of these privacy-based projects also tell you that uh, depending on the amount that you send, you have different types of privacy guarantees, and that's really confusing too. So how do we just you know, build a privacy protocol that literally just lets me send any amount of money privately in an easy way? Um, and that's basically what I've been working on for, with Ironfish for quite a long time, um, and we're slowly but surely getting to a solution that I think will actually work. And so there are many ingredients that are going to be kind of going into this privacy layer, and a lot of them are pretty technical. Um, and I'm going to walk you through some of those technical details just so you can kind of get a flavor of the kind of mass amount of effort that it takes to build a cross-chain privacy layer um, and probably why it's been a really, really hard time for other privacy projects to launch something that's usable. So um, there's something called MASP. Um, so, so yeah, so all these ingredients combined give us a privacy layer. And so Ironfish right now is layer one proof of work privacy layer. And we did that because you can't just sprinkle privacy on top of a transparent chain. You have to build it from the ground up. Um, right now it is fully decentralized with nodes all, all around the world. Um, and we are gonna support wrapped bridged assets from 27 plus chains, hopefully in a few weeks. Um, and once again, Ironfish is a privacy pool that supports many, many assets in, in a single pool so that transactions are indistinguishable from one, from one another. Um, kind of a big topic for privacy pools is definitely regulation. Um, and so for, for Ironfish, our bridge is gonna have sanction screening uh, on the ingress, meaning that transactions that go into the, the pool uh, will be screened for bad, bad actors. Okay, cool, so let's dive in. This is gonna be pretty technical, so bear with me. But again, I want you to get a feel of how much effort it takes to actually build a privacy protocol like this. So, um, uh, so Ironfish started with something called Sapling, which is the Zcash privacy protocol. And we modified it to kind of give it uh, a different type of flavor. And we also implemented, some, some, implemented something called MASP, which is multi-asset shielded protocol, meaning that it can support many assets. Um, and it is pretty highly technical, but I think it's super interesting. And there are a lot of moving pieces that, that kind of have to come together. So for Ironfish, because we started off with Sapling, the key creation is quite complex. Um, but really, you kind of have to care about just three keys, which is you have your secret key, you, you have your public key, and you have your view key. Um, so the view key lets the holder actually uh, see all the information about your account, and your public key obviously lets you request money. So secret key, just like in Ethereum, that is your private key. That's what you keep private. Um, the view key lets you actually uh, generate a transaction but not sign it and see all the transaction history. And then the public key, we did modify it from the Zcash original protocol such that there's a one-to-one -one mapping of one private key to one public key. 
because we thought it was confusing the way they did it. Um, so for Ironfish, we also have the concept of an asset, which I think is super cool because Ironfish is actually a UTXO chain. And so if you think about Bitcoin or other UTXO chains, they don't particularly have assets. And for Ironfish, we do. And an asset has kind of a definition of what that is, which actually it gets used to, uh, to hash all that data and bank it into a point on the jub jub curve, which is a type of a, a elliptic curve. And that is actually what's going to get what's going to be used to create this multi-asset shielded pool layer. So important information for, for later. And then the node structure, because Ironfish is a UTXO chain, we still have to kind of keep that um, that, that structure. But we did add an asset identifier for every single node. So now every single node has the value, the asset type, the owner, uh, and some other information about it. Um, and because it's a privacy protocol, all these nodes go into a Merkle tree that, that is an add-only Merkle tree. So then you can use that Merkle tree to actually spend nodes without revealing which node that is. Um, and so unlike other privacy chains, we did make Ironfish more modular. So for a transaction, we actually have different types of descriptions that you can attach on, a, on, a, on that transaction. So you can do things like spend, uh, you can create more nodes, you can, you can mint new assets, and then you can also burn new assets as well. Um, and so uh, this is kind of the ingredients for how to make a multi-asset privacy, po privacy pool. Um, what we did do is we actually made it so that the mint and the burn transactions, or the mint and the burn uh, uh, descriptions, have some publicly available information so that you could actually monitor whether or not a bridge that is bridging over assets is behaving properly, uh, So because that information is actually public for users to verify. Cool. So the spend description, um, it is quite complex. And so it has things like a value commitment. What are we spending? A value commitment is the Peterson commitment, meaning that the actual value is hidden. But you do get it, um, something that you can actually later on use for balancing. Um, and then it has things like the nullifier. So the nullifier is unique to the node that you're spending. And you have to reveal it as part of that uh, uh, transaction. Um, so again, a, spend, a description basically lets you spend a note without even revealing what you're spending. And that's exactly what the ZK snark that's attached to that spend description does. It basically says, there is a note. It's in the tree. I'm not even going to show you which one. I'm, I'm, I'm even going to hide my signature. Um, and all you have to know is that the nullifier that I produced is correct. Uh, but pretty much nothing else about the transaction. And then the output description basically lets, uh, lets the recipient get that note so that their wallet later on can decrypt it and then can spend it as part of a spend description in the subsequent uh, transaction. And the ZKSNARC for that kind of does, kind of does exactly that. It basically says that I have the authority to create a new note for the recipient that I'm sending that to. And then the mint description is pretty interesting because, again, it actually lets you create a different type of asset on top of this privacy pool. Um, and uh, yeah, the ZK snark basically proves that I am authorized to mint more of this asset, or I can transfer the ownership to a different asset. Um, and then the, the burn description is actually pretty simple. It just says anyone can burn any asset for any reason. There's no ZKP magic involved. So the cool thing about it is, is uh, every single one of these descriptions has what's called a value commitment, which is, again is a Peterson commitment, meaning that it hides the value of the node that you're trying to spend um, into a Peterson commitment, which is something that you can use for balancing the equation later on. And every single value has a unique value generator that is specific to that asset. And that's the important part that lets you balance a transaction, even though the transaction can have many different assets within it, again, in a totally private way. So kind of in a, you know, like the intuition behind it is that when you balance such a transaction, that spends minus outputs equals the transaction fee minus the mints plus the burns plus this binding verification key that is part of the transaction to make it all balance. Um, you can kind of think of it, OK, like for spends and the outputs, I have the value commitment. And for other things, I can do a pseudo value commitment to kind of make the math work out and make sure that the transaction does indeed balance. Um, cool. And so with that, we basically can do account balancing on that transaction, um, even though the transaction might have various different assets in it. Again, without ever showing the world what those assets are or who, who the recipient, the sender, or the amount is. So I know that was a lot. <laughs> and I just kind of want to get you this intuition behind how a privacy protocol works. 
Um, and again, this is very similar to how like Sapling works. We just expanded that to have multiple assets. Um, and so even though you didn't get all that, that's totally fine. You'll actually see the same pattern being used in many, many other privacy protocols. So for instance, ASTAC, Alio that just launched, Tornado Cache even. Um, all of them kind of use a really similar model of there's a Merkle tree and I'm going to prove that a node exists in the Merkle tree, I'm going to reveal a nullifier such that it cannot be used again. So this is actually a very, very similar pattern, and you can kind of like work a lot to expand that pattern to do what you want. Okay, cool. So the other part of the ingredient is, okay, now that we have a privacy pool that can support multiple assets, we still need to be able to support bridges so that bridges can let users transfer assets from other chains onto this privacy pool. And that is actually kind of hard to do because most bridges require multi-sig. And you know, if you've ever used Zcash, there actually is not really a private multi-sig for any privacy pr like pr protocol like at all. <laughs> and so that this part actually becomes extremely difficult. Um, and so there is a protocol called Frost. Uh, and it's a Schnorr threshold signature, and then there's an expansion of that, which is called DKG. And DKG lets you have distributed key generation, meaning that all the parties that actually are making the multi-sig wallet can do so independently without a trusted dealer. Um, and that actually has never been done before for like any privacy protocol, like production wallet ever. And so uh, that is a pretty big engineering feat that the Ironfish and the IF Labs team have done. Um, and then we're also gonna have a ledger integration for Ironfish, uh, Frost, DKG, which again, no privacy protocol has uh, like full multi-sig ledger support. Um, and so the idea behind uh, something like a Frosty KG wallet is that, let's say you're trying to set up a party of five, um, you have five participants, all of them individually create something called an identity using their own secret. Um, and then there are three rounds that they basically, the participants kind of interactively, uh, in interactively share their secrets in order to create a shared public key and a view key. So it's kind of a wallet that doesn't have a spend key per se, it has multiple spend keys from all those participants, but a single public key. Um, and then any participant can create a transaction uh, from that derived view key, uh, but unsigned transaction, and then a participant can initiate that uh, signature aggregation to actually sign the transaction, and that's basically how you achieve threshold signature multi-sig wallets. Um, so we have it right now, it's a CLI wallet. It's maybe not the most useful or e easy to use, but it does exist. Uh, and then we'll have letter support for it as well. And it doesn't, doesn't have to be easy to use because it's very specific to bridge operators to be able to actually build those multi-sig wallets in order to, br to bridge the, those transactions. Um, and so yeah, why this is important is because Multi-sigs lets you actually uh, work with these bridges. Um, and so this is a short demo of actually this working. So we're partnering up with a bridge called Chainport, and this is all testnet, so this is not live yet. Um, this is a very, very sped up video. Um, but here we are able to basically transfer a bill token from Sepolia to Ironfish, um, and it'll get minted as a wrapped asset on Ironfish. Uh, so this is my Ironfish wallet, and it's kind of hard to see, but there's a bridge transaction uh, that, got, that got put into my Ironfish wallet, so now this build token, which is an ERC-20, um, is in the privacy pool of Ironfish. And then the video kind of loops again. Um, cool, and so that's basically kind of how you achieve a, a wrapped uh, bridged asset privacy layer. Um, and so what we're hoping to do with Ironfish is actually connect Ironfish to pretty much every single EVM L2 that there is, or every single EVM chain, so that Ironfish can be a uh, privacy layer for all those assets. Um, cool, and that is all coming quite soon. So if you have any questions, please let me know, and then you can follow us on Twitter to, to kind of keep track of things. All right, thank you. Thanks.